In its March 2009 issue, the New York Times Magazine characterized Freeman Dyson's current persona as that of a civic heretic. Myself, I like to think of him at 85 years old as one of the senior wise men of the scientific tribe, someone who should be listened to, consulted on important decisions, even if you might not like what he has to say or immediately appreciate the wisdoms therein. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Freeman Dyson. And we're just going to kind of fake this as we go through. We're not, we, have it, we have it rehearsed <laughs> here. Uh, so the, 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 the formal talk is, we have two themes. One is uh, abolition of nuclear weapons, and the other is going to be in, on biotechnology, roughly, yes? Yes. You're right. So talk to me about the sermon that you gave 25 years ago. Yes, that was the, the universal. The, the uh, Unitarian Church in Davis, California. Yes. And that's how you want to say that. But to get, uh, so then it, things, certain things had changed since then, and one had to do with the, uh, with the preventive war, another with Iran and North Korea. And yes, well, what I'd like to say is we're dealing with our own nuclear weapons first, and other people's nuclear weapons are really not so much our immediate concern. We, we, we are, uh, certainly, we, we have plenty of problems with the spread of nuclear weapons in the world, but on the whole, the governments have been reasonable. I mean, we expected, when I started 50 years ago, learning about nuclear weapons, and we all expected there would be at least 50 countries with nuclear weapons by now. Well, it turns out there are only eight or nine. So we've been lucky, and, and mostly we've been lucky because mo most of the governments of the world reasonably concluded nuclear weapons are more trouble than they're worth. They're essentially, they're nothing but headaches. And we should be happy with that. And, but in the meantime, of course, we have 10,000 nuclear weapons. The Russians have about 10,000. And those are the major problems still. The world is still under immediate threat from these weapons. There are all sorts of ways in which they could destroy us, either by accident or by design. They could get stolen, they could get misused. That's what we should be worrying about primarily. And the dangers we face from Iran and North Korea and the, the uh, smaller countries are by comparison trivial. And uh, not that they're negligible, but that they shouldn't be our main concern. Our real problem is how do we get rid of ours? And that's what I'd like to talk about. <clears throat> So you talk about there, the two ways to approach it, the one, the ethics and morality of them, and the other is being practical, yeah? Yeah, I mean, when I preached the sermon 20 years, 25 years ago, because I was talking in the framework of morality, and what I had to say was essentially that nuclear weapons are a sin against God and a, a crime against the planet, and putting it in ethical terms, and that's all true. But much more serious is to convince the soldiers that nuclear weapons are not good for them. That in fact, from a military point of view, they are extraordinarily ineffective. That's, I think, a, 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 a case which still has to be made. Fortunately, there are four wise men, that Max Kampelman, who was Reagan's negotiator in, health, in, in, in Reykjavik, whenever it was, eight, eight, in 1980-something, when uh, Reagan and Gorbachev had a summit meeting in Reykjavik, they, felt they got very close to abolishing nuclear weapons right then and there. It was a b big tragedy that it never happened. 
they got close, but um, then, then, of course, each of them had professional advisors who were horrified at the idea of, a rad of drastic changes in, in, in the situation. So they both of them got bad advice from their advisors. Anyhow, it ended up that they didn't agree, but they came pretty close. And now, uh, Mark Kampelman, who is still around, who was Reagan's negotiator, has now started a campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, period. And he's got support from a number of these Republicans. It's very important, of course, to have people with good hardline credentials. And, and uh, Max Campbellton is one, Henry Kissinger is another, Sam Nunn is the third, and uh, I forget who the fourth is. Anyway, there were the, these four wise men who wrote a letter to the Wall Street Journal proclaiming now is the time to get rid of nuclear weapons. And that happened about two years ago. And they've got considerable support from around the world. So I, this is now uh, definitely on the agenda as an objective for the world to aim at. And I think there's a good chance that something might happen. Distinguishing between the, uh, there, there were two approaches you mentioned of, of uh, getting rid of, globally getting rid of nuclear weapons or reducing the number. One was uh, through negotiations and big committees and the other was just unilateral. Right. And uh, of course both are undoubtedly necessary, but I prefer the unilateral route because it works. And uh, we have some demonstrations of that. I think the most dramatic was in fact the abolition of American biological weapons by President Nixon. And that was a remarkable achievement. And it happened in a way by luck, in a sense, because Nixon wasn't a man who is renowned for his wisdom, but uh, <laughs> he, he, did, he, he did the right thing on several occasions. I mean, of course, a, a more famous occasion is when he, when he made the trip to China to reestablish diplomatic relations with China. That was a very important step, too. But anyhow, when it came to biological weapons, the United States had a huge biological weapons program, which uh, started already a little bit during World War II and, and continued ever since. And it had grown to a monstrous size, so we had huge stockpiles of these biological weapons, which were uh, an enormous threat both to ourselves and to everybody else. And they weren't widely publicized. But anyway, there they were. Well, it happened by very good chance that Matthew Messelson, who is a famous biologist who is still around, he's, uh, who happened to be very knowledgeable in the area of biological weapons, he had made it his mission in life to get rid of them. And it happened by good luck that Matthew Messelson, he was a professor at Harvard, that he had a summer place on Cape Cod which was next door to Henry Kissinger. And Henry Kissinger was the, the national security advisor to Nixon. So by good luck, uh, Messelson convinced Kissinger when they were sitting on the veranda one day at the summer place uh, that it was just about time to get rid of biological weapons. And Kissinger convinced Nixon and Nixon did it. And, the way, the way he did it was very simple. He just unilaterally declared that the entire program was abolished, all the stockpiles were to be destroyed, and the laboratories were to be opened, no longer secret. And, and this duly happened. So the example number one is the biological weapons. Unilateral, and then you, the George W. Bush one, yeah? Yeah, the second example. Or the George Bush, no, George Sr., yeah. The second example is George Bush Sr. This happened in, in 1989, just before the Soviet Union disintegrated. Gorbachev was still chief in the, of, of the Soviet Union. And, but it was clear that the Cold War had sort of come to an end. Germany had been, by that time, had been unified. The, the Berlin Wall had come down. 
So it was clear that the Cold War, was, in some sense, was over. And so George Bush Sr. decided the time, had got, the time had come to get rid of a lot of our nuclear weapons unilaterally, which he did. In fact, I mean, George Bush Sr. in fact was the, the one person in the world who got rid of the most nuclear weapons. And the, the, the joke is, of course, that he was very careful to do this quietly. He, he didn't want to be renowned for getting rid of nuclear weapons, uh, he, but he actually was extraordinarily effective. So what happened was he, uh, in fact, one Friday afternoon, he signed the order completely removing all nuclear weapons from the United States Army and from the surface navy, which meant about half of the total nuclear weapons. So all the army weapons, which were they were the most dangerous, in fact, in, in, scattered all over the world in exposed places, and the nuclear, the tactical nuclear weapons on, on, on surface ships were just removed overnight by executive order just like the biological weapons. And he was even a little bit cleverer, but he arranged to have this happen the same day as the settlement of the lawsuit between the tobacco industry and its critics. So the headlines in the newspapers the next day were all about tobacco and not about nuclear weapons. So he got away with it sort of quietly without anybody noticing. And, but now the... Army and the Navy, in fact, are much happier being non-nuclear. I remember when, when uh, sometime before this, I actually went on a visit to the United States Princeton. I happen to live in Princeton, but that's sort of a coincidence. And, uh, but anyway, I, I was on board the Princeton, which was at that time a missile cruiser in Long Beach Harbor in California. And, uh, there on this cruiser that was a surface ship armed with nuclear weapons, there were two huge boxes of Tomahawk missiles, half, 98 missiles altogether. 49 of them were nukes and 49 were conventional. And there they were in two huge boxes on board the ship. And I had this, this, this uneasy feeling, well, suppose that the captain makes a mistake, what happens? And, and, it's, he has to be very careful to remember which is which. And, and <laughs> so it was an, sort of an accident waiting to happen. And so I was greatly relieved when these tactical nukes were taken off the ships. So it, 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 the surface navy is, of course, a sort of clean way of fighting a war. And, it's all the more dangerous for that. It's sort of an easy way for a nuclear war to start with surface ships shooting at each other. And uh, so I think we are much better off without them, no matter what the Russians do. In fact, again, in that case, after we had removed our surface weapons, uh, uh, tactical weapons, the Russians, in fact, did get rid of a lot of theirs, but not to the same extent. So at the moment, they still have a large number of tactical nukes in their army, which, of course, they, they say is right and proper because our conventional army is much stronger than theirs. So they consider that it's reasonable for them to have tactical nukes even if we don't. Anyhow, we can argue about that. I, st I, still, I think, in fact, it was a big step forward. And so... Th th George Bush Sr. should get honored for it. So, what's next? Well, the, then the, 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 the next thing I was going to talk about, which I sort of already mentioned, is this uh, push in the last two years to begin discussing the abolition of nuclear weapons in, uh, on an international basis. Nobody now is talking about doing it unilaterally, and I wish they would. Uh, at the moment, all the discussion, and including President Obama and various other people, all the discussion is about a 
very, very strongly verified treaty, which everybody has to be included. So they talk about verification, they talk about enforcement. And that, to my mind, is the wrong way to go. But still, I could be wrong there too. I mean, there, there are all sorts of possibilities. I, I wish we would talk more about getting rid of our own weapons and less about enforcing whatever we want to impose on Iran. So, uh, one of the points, <clears throat> the question is, uh, uh, what are nuclear weapons good for? Yeah, the, 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 it's an interesting question what nuclear weapons are good for. And, and uh, of course, the whole mystique of nuclear weapons originated with Hiroshima. And everybody knows that Hiroshima brought World War II to an end. At least everybody thought that was true, including me. I mean, it was, it was sort of obvious in 1945. At that time, I was in England. We read in the newspaper, the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. And then a couple of days later, the Japanese surrendered. Obviously, that was what, what brought the war to an end. And everybody in this country and everybody in England believed that. I happen to think now that it's totally untrue. And I think that's important. And the reason I changed my mind is that there's been a lot of historical study, mostly done by Japanese historians, as to what really did happen in Japan during that crucial week after the bomb was dropped in Hiroshima, what did really happen in Japan. And it's a very interesting story. There is a, a, a historian called uh, Tsuyoshi Hayakawa or Hayagawa who wrote a book about this. And I have a friend in Princeton who is an American called Ward Wilson who has written about it. And several other people have written about it. The facts are beginning to become clear after 60, 63 years or how, how long it is. The, uh, the fact is that the important decisions in the Japanese government were made by the Supreme War Council, which was the emperor plus six other gentlemen, I think three military and three civilians. It was a very small body. and They had the supreme authority to decide what should happen. And so when a really important decision, such as ending the war, had to be made, Obviously, the Supreme War Council had to meet. Well, what actually happened that the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima in the morning of August 6th, whatever it was. Uh, the same morning, the minister of the Navy asked if they could hold a meeting of the Supreme War Council. And the decision was no, they didn't have a meeting just wasn't considered important enough. They knew very well that Hiroshima had been bombed. They knew that it was a nuclear weapon. But it wasn't worth discussing at a Supreme War meeting. Three days later then, well, there's a succession of events. There's an interesting, uh, in, on, the, on the 8th of August, which was two days after Hiroshima, there is a document which is quite illuminating, which is written again by the Secretary of the Navy, recording a conversation with his deputy. And they talk about the terrible thing that's happening, that the rice ration in Tokyo is reduced by 10%. That's the main subject of discussion. And then there's a remark about Hiroshima, which is quite incidental. So clearly, it wasn't very much on their minds. Well, then comes August the 9th, which is three days after Hiroshima. And at that point, something actually happens. Namely, the Russians invade Manchuria. The, the Russians declared war and massively invade the northern territories occupied by Japan. They don't, they're not yet in Japan, but they're in Japanese-occupied Manchuria, and they also invaded the island of Sakhalin, which was part of Japan at that time. Within six hours, the Supreme War Council then was in session. 
So that was clearly the event that caused the Supreme, Supreme War, War Council to meet. They had to decide what to do because the Russians had declared war and were invading their country. That same day, the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, but that actually happened after the meeting was in session, so it had no effect on the, the question of calling the meeting. The meeting was called quite clearly in response to the Soviet de declaration of war. And the meeting was the decisive meeting at which they decided then to surrender to the Americans. So that's the historical sequence of events, which I think is almost completely clear by itself. Then there's another piece of evidence which is extremely interesting, which is the actual text of the order issued by the emperor ordering all the military forces to surrender. And that, of course, was a very tricky question because the emperor couldn't be, be sure the soldiers would actually obey. It went against all their traditions to surrender to anybody. And of course, the Japanese were very, very fierce and ferocious fighters who always fought to the last man whenever they were defeated. So it wasn't at all sure that the army would in fact surrender when the emperor gave the order. And there was a ch quite a chance there might be a military coup. And anyhow, so what did the emperor actually say to the uh, uh, military forces? He didn't talk about nuclear weapons at all. What he said was, look at what happened in 1895. He was thinking history, not technology. Uh, in 1895, a very important event happened in Japanese history, which every Japanese soldier, of course, would know. Probably every Japanese school child would know. In 1895, there was the first war between Japan and China. Japan invaded Manchuria, which had, well, had been Chinese, and occupied Manchuria, in particular the naval base at Port Arthur. And so it was a famous Japanese victory, the, sort of the first real important Japanese victory. And then the European powers intervened. Germany, Russia, and Britain, I think, were the three European powers. And they said that, that, that that's not allowed. You don't do that. So they sent armies into Manchuria. And the Japanese emperor had to decide what to do. And the Japanese emperor at that time was the, the Meiji, the grandfather of Hirohito, who was the emperor in 1945. Well, Meiji was the, the, sort of the really great Japanese emperor. He was the one who modernized Japan. He was an emperor whom everybody had the highest respect for. He was a god, essentially. So anything Meiji did was worthy of respect. And what did Meiji actually do in 1895? He surrendered to the Europeans. He decided it wasn't worth it to fight the Russians and have them invade Japan. So to keep the Russians out of Japan, he accepted the European terms withdrew the Japanese forces from Manchuria, so effectively simply surrendered. And so what Hirohito was saying to the troops in 1945 was, this is what we have to do. My grandfather did it, so I'm going to do it too. We have to surrender to, to keep the Russians out of Japan. And that's what happened. So I think this makes a very coherent story. That's rather a long piece of, 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 of narrative. But anyway, we'll, let's continue the conversation. Okay, but, but I think it's, <laughs> I think it's a, you know, an excellent point because we're all, we've all been, uh, as you were growing up with this story, that you know, the, reason the, the, the whole reasoning of the Japanese in surrendering had to do with the fact we beat them up with uh, nuclear weapons. Right, and everybody believes that. And, and that's still why we have, this, programs, we have yeah. this exaggerated respect for nuclear weapons. Right. And of course, uh, uh, if you, if you uh, 
finally realize that's not true makes it much more thinkable to get rid of nuclear weapons. That's why it's important. Yeah, who would ever blow one off anyway at this point? There was, a, we were gonna, uh, there was another, there was just some other myths you had mentioned. One was whether or not Hitler had uh, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, which he didn't. Yes, that's an interesting question too, that everybody believed, that, and that's why our people all went to Los Alamos to build bombs, because they were all afraid the Germans would get the bombs first and would use them to conquer the world. And uh, I, I think if you look at it carefully, you can see that, in fact, if Hitler had got the bomb first, he would, couldn't have possibly used it to conquer the world. In fact, he probably would have lost the war even sooner because we would have had a stronger... I mean, what would have happened if Hitler had the bomb first? He would have uh, uh, demolished a large fraction of London. He would have demolished a large fraction of Moscow. And we would, would have had much stronger incentive to get to Berlin fast. So I think the ch chances are the end of the war would have come sooner, in fact. Uh, I probably wouldn't be here to talk about it, but uh, otherwise... <laughs> Another one was the, uh, uh, the myth about the, about the hydrogen bomb changing nuclear warfare really was a myth on. Right? That's also another myth, which is a, a sort of a side issue, but it, it is in fact true that uh, uh, people imagine the hydrogen bomb has changed nuclear warfare by a huge factor, but it, in fact it didn't. What happened, because nobody actually needed these enormous megaton bombs, which we started out with in the 1950s. If you look at the stockpile we have now, there are no megaton bombs at all. And the hydrogen bombs we have are quite small comparatively. And if you look at the actual stockpile, it's almost exactly the same as it would have been if we never had hydrogen bombs in the first place. So the nature of the problem has not changed as a result of hydrogen bombs. It's, it's true they're, they're more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb, but essentially it's the same problem. Militarily, they're really no, no big, big, essentially no difference. And the last thing you say about whether international agreements are worthless or they're still worth something, yeah, to get rid of them? If, if you don't verify them, yes. I mean, that's the, the, the sort of, it's, it's taken for granted by the political science experts that a, a treaty that cannot be totally verified is worthless. And that is not true. There have been many treaties in history which have been unverifiable and many of them have been violated. And they're still very helpful. I mean, there's the treaty between the United States and Canada about the armaments of the ships on the Great Lakes, which was signed in 1817 after the 1812 war. And that treaty has been extraordinarily helpful in keeping the border between the United States and Canada peaceful for 100 and whatever it is, uh, uh, almost 200 years. And uh, it's been repeatedly violated, certainly not verified, but it's still very helpful in, uh, when there are problems. And it, this was particularly true at the time of the American Civil War. There were problems with the Canadians and... and uh, there have been many, uh, uh, well, before Canada was independent, there were problems with the British, of course. And, and anyhow, it, this treaty was always helpful on both sides to sort of keep the warmongers quiet. And that's what treaties are for, basically. They're, 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 they have more effect on your own side than on the other side. It's interesting also that the, uh, these unilateral moves were made by uh, by. Rep editorially, Republican warmongers. No, I shouldn't say that. But uh, no, but, but that Reagan, you know, that Reagan and Bush uh, and, and, uh, and Nixon seem to have been ones who have made the greatest uh, move these, of these unilateral moves and so forth to actually get rid of weapons. And, you know, there's yes, some that's not accidental, that. of course. No. It's, it, it, if, if you're not a Republican, the Republicans will beat you up. And, and <laughs> <laughs> if you do it. If you, if you are a, a good hardline Republican, you have a chance to do something like that. And yeah, so maybe, but Obama's gonna do better, yeah? Yeah, we... <laughs> no, we certainly hope a lot from Obama, but it's much harder for him. Yeah, to do that sort of thing.
Okay, so we're going to switch now and talk about um, green technology. Right. And genomes, from nukes to genomes, and the domestication of biotechnology. And, and uh, so do you believe in biotechnology, yeah? Yes, that's of course one of my main interests. Is, uh, I don't do biology, but I, I'm a cheerleader for the biologists. And it's, it's, uh, no, it's the most exciting part of science in the, in the, in, at the present time. It's going ahead very fast. And it is sort of it's nature's way of doing chemistry, much cleaner, much more sustainable, and, and much more efficient than old-fashioned chemistry. And so I think well, that's what we're going to be doing for the next 100 years or so, is sort of learning how to do chemistry really cleverly with living creatures. And uh, it's, you, you can imagine almost all of the polluting industries being replaced by some kind of biological methods which, is, which avoid most of the pollution and also maybe are cheaper and cleaner and quieter and more pleasant to live with. So it, the, 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 there's an enormous versatility in biotech which seems to me to be a huge advantage in the long run because we haven't yet learned how to do it but still we have made some progress I and mean, if you look at what we already do with biology it's quite remarkable it's most it was mostly in the hands of the drug industry at the moment so and it has its good side and its bad side of course uh, like like all kinds of science but uh, it does have an amazing amount of good the if you, if you just imagine what we can do with vaccines to prevent diseases, we sort of take it for granted that we're not all dying from smallpox anymore, and that's entirely due to a vaccine. We're not dying of polio, and there's all sorts of diseases which have been essentially eliminated. And uh, that's an example of what biotech can do. And it's going ahead now very fast. So that's... Uh, the way I see the future, that uh, it will become more and more just a normal part of our lives. Will not won't just be in the hands of the drug companies, but will be in the hands of people like uh, like you. And and uh, so what I what I have in mind when I talk about bio, biotech being domesticated is what happened to the computer industry, which started out in the same way as biotech, as sort of being big and dirty. And I remember. 50 years ago, I was in Princeton. They were building in Princeton the first programmable electronic computer that uh, John von Neumann, the mathematician, was the leader of the project. And so we were building this uh, quite by the standards of the time, powerful computer, which was big and massive and complicated. And we all imagined computers like that, sort of build, uh, uh, occupying a large room and uh, using plenty of power, 
And of course, we all know that the pharmaceutical industry also has a downside. So we'll see what happens. We, we, we've got to establish rules of the game, decide what's allowed and what's forbidden. We haven't done so badly so far. And I was thinking with the, when the question of biotechnology came up and <clears throat> I looked at it a lot and comparing it to nuclear, I mean, nuclear was very containable in the sense that if you didn't have fissionable material or, or you know, high explosives and, you know, going to collapse symmetrically and so forth, I mean, there was really, there weren't many people that even had the potential to do it. And then you look at the biotech stuff and it's, I mean, if you, for five or $10,000 in your basement, I mean, you're less, you're like leading edge, you know? And so this is, it's just not containable. So, I mean, one of the things you were mentioning, it, so the question is like, that confronts us with this is a different set of problems. And just in question is like, you know, what are we gonna do? What are the rules gonna be? And then how are we gonna set it? And I guess we, we learn as we go, yeah? Yes, I think so. I mean, you, 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 you have a real problem already. I mean, disease germs can be manipulated very easily. So you have not only the natural diseases, you can also have artificial diseases. We know how to do that already. We've known that for, for 20 or 30 years. So that's a real hazard which we are already living with. And it's a question, how much worse can it get? So far, we've been lucky. And I think it, it's perhaps, again, we, we, we are dealing with human beings who also are not as evil as they, they might have been. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a remarkable fact that the terrorists have not actually used either nuclear weapons or biological weapons on a big scale. They have played around a bit with biological weapons. The Japanese in particular, the, the people in Tokyo, uh, tried to spread anthrax and then there was the gentleman in this country who, probably one of my colleagues in Princeton who, who uh, put some anthrax in the mail. And so it has happened on a very small scale. But somehow or other, the, even the terrorists somehow don't seem to go for this. So we, we, we are lucky and I think we ought to have some respect even for our enemies. We, we, uh, what we have to do is, of course, to deal with the problem is, first of all, to understand our enemies, understand where they're coming from and why they are anxious to kill us and from time to time. And, and, uh, but it is a human problem and not a technical problem, primarily. So, uh, where's the <clears throat> thinking of where is it open source biology and plants, we're gonna, we're gonna breed some new plants and where's all this biotech gonna lead? Do, uh, yeah, well, artificial let me, crop uh, plants and stuff? I, mean, I, I think one of the things to talk about is solar energy. Uh, solar energy is by far the most abundant source of energy we have. It's, it's renewable, it's sustainable. It's very well distributed over the earth. It's obviously the, in the long run, and it's also bigger than any other source of energy. So in the long run, that's what we're going to use. The question just is making it cheap enough and accessible to everybody, and that's a problem. But I would say it's a problem which has a fairly, clearly a biological answer, that in the long run, we're going to deal with solar energy with plants Plants are sort of designed for the purpose. The whole, the, the, the essential nature of a plant is it converts sunlight into liquid fuels. That's what it does. And it's only, at the moment, it's only about 1% efficient. The best commercial crop plants like sugar cane and, and ordinary corn are about 1% efficient under good conditions. And you want to have, in order to, to produce enough liquid fuel to supply the whole world with the available land, you need something like 10% efficiency, otherwise you run out of land. And, and, and uh, so it's a difference between 1% and 10%, which is lacking. Uh, 
And it seems to be very likely that we will learn how to do that. It's not such a huge difference. And if we can, if we can grow plants that would convert sunlight into liquid fuel with 10% efficiency, in, 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 in a sense, sort of the problem of energy is solved as long as the population remains not too far from the present level, we've got to deal with the population problem as well. But that seems to be a, a, a problem that we're having a good deal of success with. I mean, I'm amazed, in, in, since 50 years ago, we believed the population explosion was out of control much more than it actually was. 50 years ago, the average family size in Mexico was seven. Now it is two and a half. Well, I mean, so something happened in Mexico which changed it drastically. And it's, it's essentially the fact that Mexico changed from being very poor to being only slightly poor. Still, it's not a rich country even now, but it's not as poor as it was. And also that the, the women have taken charge, which is, of course, the primary factor. <laughs> So it's fairly clear that this works pretty well. It worked, of course, in Western Europe conspicuously. Most of the Western European countries are not even reproducing themselves. So as soon as you make people rich and educate the women, essentially that problem is solved. So I think we have a very good chance, at, 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 at particularly since the big countries, China and India, are going the same way. One of, one of your, uh, the themes that you've been talking about is <clears throat> uh, uh, um, a lot of people were worried about, uh, I mean, Monsanto's not our maybe favorite people and some of the things they've done, but these crops for, uh, for Africa and for rural communities that are going to mean that, that, that's one of the, you, uh, I think, raised the question that the, the worries about the, about the negatives of some of these uh, new crops uh, is really minor compared to the potential benefit for rural communities and for changing the uh, this whole formula of rural. I'm going to the green and gray and technologies. I mean, the, if we get have develop these new uh, tech, these new biotechnologies, these new crop plants that are going to grow in in uh, 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 areas where they not, would not have otherwise grown well, and 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 this going to change all this this tendency of everybody to migrate into cities and will reestablish. I mean, you had a whole theme about the... Right. I mean, the fact is that the, the world essentially depends on two crops. I mean, I was looking at it in a... just, just in a very broad brush fashion. The, 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 the Middle East, which was the cradle of European civilization, lives on wheat, and East Asia lives on rice. And that we've taken about 10,000 years to breed the existing crop plants, which actually feed those countries quite comfortably. And that didn't happen in Africa in, and, or in South America. In, in, in Africa and South America, they don't have such highly efficient crop plants. And they also have problems with climate and with other, with other natural, so natural and artificial disadvantages. So if, if Africa had another 10,000 years, they could certainly develop good crop plants just as China and, and the Middle East did, but they don't have that much time. So uh, once again, biotech can come to the rescue. We will undoubtedly find better crop plants for Africa. And uh, I, I would hope also ameliorations of the climate. It, it is a, a fact of life which I find very significant that if you look at the Sahara Desert, which is the biggest desert in the world and certainly a very uncomfortable place to live, you find rock paintings all over the Sahara in many remote places where there were people living quite recently, that's 6,000 years ago, the Sahara was green. We know there were people living there, and you see rock paintings of herds of cows, herds of giraffes, and an occasional hippopotamus. And so obviously there were rivers and there were green trees and grass. The whole place was green 6,000 years ago. 
So why should it be a desert? We don't know. We absolutely don't understand that. Why did it become a desert? All we know is that it happened, and it probably didn't have much to do with human beings. We don't know that for sure either. But probably some natural change in the climate caused the Sahara to become a desert. What we do know is that the climate at the same time in Europe was considerably warmer than it is now. There were trees growing at higher latitudes in Europe than are growing now, and there were also smaller glaciers in Switzerland than there are today. So the whole European climate apparently was warmer. Africa was wet. Uh, well, is it possible we could bring that back? It's a question. I don't say I, I know the answer. But it seems to me it's quite possible we could bring that back. In fact, there's no reason to believe the present climate is particularly good. Uh, moving right along. We've covered that you get ahead of me here, so I'm trying to figure where I am. Uh, what's going on? I think we should get, the, 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 we're, we're kind of there on that. I want to, we're going to move into this sort of semi thing about the freedom of inquiry. And um, the, the, there was actually something, I think it was in today's paper about Obama had, had freed up the, uh, um, the work on uh, stem cells. Instance. And previous to that, it was, uh, you know, like who's who's going to who's going to be the person who's going to overlook these technologies? There's the famous example when uh, biotechnology started. It was in Princeton, and and there were all these horror stories came out, and these guys were doing Frankenstein in the lab and everything. And and uh, you were involved in some of that, yeah? Right. Let let me put that a little bit in context. That. Uh, <laughs> Thirty years ago, sort of the modern times in biotech began quite suddenly with a technique of gene splicing, which came very suddenly and quite unexpectedly. It turned out to be extremely easy to move genes around from one creature to another. It's called gene splicing. It just means just, just sort of tying together the ends of genes. And put, so putting uh, genes from bacteria into animals and plants, it didn't matter at all where they came from. It was very easy just to put them together. And it, it, to everybody's surprise, it was suddenly possible to mix genes from different kinds of species absolutely freely. And of course, uh, that, that was obviously a very dangerous technology. You could imagine immediately putting diseased genes for all kinds of, of venomous chemicals into harmless bacteria. For, I mean, for example, you could put all sorts of, uh, of disease characteristics, uh, take, take genes from a cholera virus and put it into a E. coli, which is something which normally lives in human beings, you could do terrible damage by mixing genes from disease germs into other kinds of creatures. So immediately, the biologists called an international meeting. This was, I think, an amazing uh, achievement on the part of the biologists with absolutely no help from the governments. This was entirely a voluntary movement. The biologists declared a moratorium that nobody should be doing any experiments of this kind until they got together and agreed on the rules. And that happened. So they had actually two meetings in California. People came from all over the world. And they agreed on what they called guidelines, which meant there were certain experiments you were allowed to do, certain experiments you were forbidden to do, and others in between, which, which could be done, but only under con strict containment conditions. And that has worked amazingly well. So these guidelines have remained in force now for the, for the last 30 years. And we've really had very little in the way of problems. And the, the public health hazards that were foreseen right at the start have been avoided. And I, I think it's, it, it's something we should be very proud of. 
And a small side, this is a, a little sideshow, the, the, the town of Princeton, considering itself, of course, as the inter inter intellectual hub of the world, uh, had its own citizens committee to decide our personal guidelines. So the town of Princeton had to have its own rules. And so I sat on that citizens committee and it was very illuminating. We, we, we educated the public. We had a lot of meetings. And we agreed on guidelines for the town of Princeton, so Princeton University could do these experiments with the appropriate precautions. And I, what, I, I was then talking to the public about these questions, and I drew the analogy between scientific experiments on the one side and books on the other. They both of them have the same character that they're dangerous and that they're also at the core of our intellectual lives. And so that they raise the same kind of ethical issues. And so in the year 1644, John Milton, the poet, made a speech to the British Parliament appealing for freedom of books, freedom of, the, of printing, which of course at that time did not exist. And he made this very eloquent speech, which fell on deaf ears and, and so the, the, the freedom of the press only came later with a lot of setbacks. There was still in Milton's lifetime, there was still censorship of books. And the point that Milton made very eloquently was that books actually are very dangerous, especially in those times, because Europe was racked by religious wars. England was in the middle of a civil war, and Germany was in a 30 years war, which was even worse. These were religious wars where books played an important part. So the, Milton said books not, not they, they not only corrupt souls, but also destroy bodies. That they, they are really dangerous if you allow books to propagate freely. They cause people to kill each other. And that's true of science also, that uh, we are running all kinds of terrible risks every time we think a new thought. You can't escape that. And as Milton said, the problem is it would be very, if you had a, a sort of a, a group of wise philosophers to decide what could be printed and what could not be printed, that would be all right. But in the real world, that's not the way it works. What kind of people do you actually get to sort out the good from the bad? Well, the answer is, of course, you get political hacks. There's nothing else, because anybody who is sitting all his life reading, as Milton said, books and pamphlets all his life is just going to get thoroughly bored. It's a kind of occupation nobody with a real mind would want. And you're only, the only people who are going to do it, in fact, are the people you don't want to do it. And the same is true of science, that if you look at what actually happens when you try to censor scientific thoughts, well, you've seen examples of that. that uh, as Milton said, that uh, the censors of books, they would either, uh, I, I don't remember the phrase by heart, but anyway, based, uh, on the one hand, they would, be remiss and, 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 and uh, careless on, on, on the other side, basely pecuniary. And anyhow, that's what happened, of course, if you look at the people who actually censored science in the last hundred years, particularly in Russia, these were political hacks, people who, 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 who destroyed Russian biology their leader being Lysenko, 
who sent all his rivals to Siberia to perish miserably. And that's the kind of people you get. Or on the other hand, the basely pecuniary, who are the capitalist lobbyists who surround the government in, 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 in the West. So there's, there's no set of philosophers who can actually rule over us. We have the choice either of being free to do ex experiments with reasonable precautions or else being governed by political hacks. And of course, the, the stem cell business was an example of that too, but not so extreme. The stem cells were regulated by President Bush and his friends sort of on, on ideological grounds, which made no scientific sense and really made no sense even either from religious grounds as far as I could see. And uh, so anyway, now we're finished with that. Okay, so we're, we're going to go to questions now. If you want to just say thank you Good. for this so far. And let's start going. <clears throat> I have various things. I'll get. I'll do the first question since I'm already here. While you guys are going to go to the mics, and I'll be real quick. So, I, I wanted to. Um, I got to choose my time here carefully. Well, let the lady well, speak while she's there. Okay, go. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I couldn't help but notice that you're quite old, and um, <laughs> as somebody who spends a lot of my time with 90-year-olds, uh, I was wondering what you think. We have this big division between countries with quite an enormous tsunami of 80, 90, 100 year old people, never say that, centenarians coming toward us. So we have this big group of countries with a large population of very old people. And then we have this large group of countries with an enormous population of very young people. And it's probably the biggest division we've ever had in human history. And I wonder, since you have a big thought on every big thing, if you have a big thought about that, no, I don't have any big thoughts. I, I'm only favorably impressed with how things have changed in the last hundred years. I remember when I was a school kid, we looked at this population diagrams of the different countries. At, uh, when, when you had a, a young population, it was like a triangle with a broad base and a very narrow top. And that was Japan. And then you looked at England and it was a narrow base and a broad top. It was most, uh, the, uh, an, uh, an aging population. And so Japan and England were radically different. Well, if you look at them today, Japan is just as narrow as England. Japan has now got an aging population too. And it goes rather quickly. Over, it takes about 50 years to change from one to the other. And the, the remarkable thing is that the changes are all in that direction, that Countries which used to be very young became aging pretty fast. And all it seems to take for that to happen is they have to get rich. Then they, then they, they take trouble then to stay alive. And so they become old rather fast. So I find that on the whole a very a, 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 a cheerful thought that this is going to happen. Now the countries which are very young are the countries like the Arab countries where women have no power. And there are, of course, examples in Africa where, again, an African chief has usually four. Uh, uh, one of my kids was in the Peace Corps in Africa, so she knows how it goes. The chief has four wives, and the chiefs then compete to have as many kids as possible. To be a really big chief, you have to have at least 40 kids. and. Uh, so that's still a fact of life in certain parts of Africa. But it's getting very rare. And it's, it's uh, I, th I think, even in Africa and even in the Arab countries, there's a, a clear signs of movement. And, and of course, I already mentioned Mexico, which is a conspicuous example of this. So that we are aging as a species, not just as a country. And, Anyway, so I love nine, I love nine year olds, but I think it's a, a, a wonderful thing not to not to have too many of them. <laughs>
Thanks, Terry. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Stuart Brand was speaking at Powell's, pushing his book, Whole Earth Discipline. And it turns out that he and a number of the ecological biologists are now pushing uh, the cleaner forms of uh, nuclear fission power. So that's the biologists that are pushing fission power. And uh, tonight we're hearing a, uh, a person who, who grew beyond physics talking about uh, biological power. Now, is this mutual respect or greener pastures in the other person's camp? Or, uh, and, and meanwhile, we had Richard Smalley, talk, uh, chemist, talking about we need everything. So. Where are we going with this? Or is this mutual respect or what? Yes, it's mutual respect. And I'm, 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 uh, Stuart Brand is one of my heroes, and, and it, 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 he, he's also capable of changing his mind, which is a very important virtue. So I'm happy to welcome him to the Friends of Fission. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, the, the point about f fission power, it's not that important. It's, it's, it's not as good as its friends thought it was. It's not as bad as its enemies thought it was. It's just, it, it's one of the possibilities. And I think the, 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 the way to do technology creatively is to make your mistakes on a small scale as far as you can. And so you have to learn how to make mistakes. And the only way to do that is to make mistakes, and, but make them on a small scale so that are not disasters. And that's, I think, what we've done reasonably well with fission. There's been one major disaster, which was Chernobyl. But it's also not as bad as it's often portrayed. I mean, Chernobyl, in fact, killed a few hundred people. Well, that's bad. But chemical accidents do that all the time. Coal mining accidents do it all the time. So it's, it's not out of line. Uh, fission, on the whole, has, not, has been pretty free of accidents. And we should be proud of that. It's not going to solve the energy problem by itself. It's, 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 a, it's, it's part of the solution. And the same is true, of course, of all sorts of biology, of bi 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 biological solar energy, and also photovoltaic energy that's collecting sunlight just from, from uh, silicon collectors. That's another technology which is going ahead quite nicely. We should do them all. We, and it's, it's, it's very foolish to make choices before you have to. Can I go right here? Um, I'm a seventh grader in Westland, and um, I was watching a, um, a show, and I w heard about a man who is working with a team of scientists to create a synthetic tree that can absorb CO2 and omit oxygen the same way a real tree would, but it would be man-made so we could process as much as we wanted at a higher pace than trees actually grow. And I was wondering if this would be considered biotech and why or why not? Well, that's a good question. I'm sorry I can't see your she's face. She's but over here to the left. Oh, yes, over there, yes. Uh, it all depends on what chemistry is being used. The, I mean, a, a, a tree of, is just a way of doing chemistry in a very particularly elegant fashion, which has been worked out by nature. And we have artificial methods of doing chemistry, which generally don't work so nicely. And whether you call it bio biology or chemistry is to some extent just a matter of taste. So I'd like just to see the details. It's, it, it certainly sounds like a reasonable proposal. It's all a question of the details, whether it really is better than a natural tree or not, or whether it's more convenient for some purposes. Well, they said that there was, although there was advantages to a tree like that, it used um, electricity, and they weren't sure whether it produced more oxygen than it used electricity, or whether it was just not helpful. <laughs> At yes. All. Well, if it uses electricity, I can well believe it's not helpful. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I'd be happy to look at the details. 
in the meantime, I mean, that kind of experiment may be helpful even if the thing itself doesn't turn out to be useful. Right, it's one step closer in the right direction. Uh, right. Okay, we're going to get one up above here. She always asks the question. Up above there, go ahead. Uh, my name is Christian Larson, and I'm an eighth grade student at Oregon Connections Academy. And I'm going to ask your opinion on, um, I remember at the outset you were mentioning about the disposal or rather destruction of nuclear or biochemical weapons. And um, I'm wondering on your, your opinion on how they would affect the, uh, the world on a global scale. Yes, it, it, it's of course a problem we haven't solved. The biological weapons can be destroyed just by cooking. Just put them into incinerators and collect the waste products carefully. You can get rid of them. It's expensive and it's t tiresome, but it can be done. And it doesn't contaminate the planet particularly. So that's, uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of how you do it and, and where you do it, and so there's, there are arguments about it, but it's not a particularly hard problem. Nuclear materials are much harder because you can't actually destroy them. All you can do is transmute them or put them in a safe place. One of the advantages of this spaceship that I worked on 50 years ago, the Orion ship, which used nuclear bombs in order to drive the ship. At, that, at the same time you traveled around the solar system having a great time, at the same time you were getting rid of nuclear weapons. And <laughs> so it sort of solved two problems with, with one ship. And so we don't want to do that anymore. It, it was a, 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 all right as long as you were far away from the Earth, but not so good when you were close to the Earth. So it, we do have a problem with nuclear materials. It, it, it's, it, you have to decide what your objectives should be. The, the way the United States has dealt with the problem is not good because we have written laws which essentially are impossible to obey. That is, the law says you have to dispose of nuclear materials permanently and safely, and that's it, and retrievably. That's uh, uh, the three things. And those are incompatible. The, so, the, so the law is written in such a way as to make the problem unsolvable. And that's, uh, that's unfortunate. But it, so that's why we got stuck with the Yucca Mountain repository that's supposed to be a sort of final repository for nuclear weapons or nuclear materials. And you can easily show that nothing is really final, that uh, if you wait long enough, something bad is going to happen and that things are not going to just stay the way they are and you can't predict what's going to happen. So the whole thing, in fact, is a sort of logical contradiction. Other countries are quite different. Other countries mostly believe in what they call interim storage, which I think makes a lot of sense. As you just have a, a big concrete building and, and, a, big, and a, a, a lock which is well protected, and you put the stuff in there and leave it and let it cool off. And that works because the volume of nuclear materials is not very large. A, a room this size would probably be enough to contain all the nuclear materials for the world for a hundred years or so. And so it, it's quite a practical way of doing it. All you have to say is we're going to solve the problem for the next hundred years and then we'll decide what to do next. And, and, and that's, to my mind, the reasonable way to do it. Let's uh, go over here. My question is, what do you see for the future for space exploration in the next hundred years, and do you favor a robotic focus or a manned focus? Well, that's a very nice question because it happened that I was in Russia in March watching a Russian space launch, 
and it was uh, very illuminating to me because their space culture is so different from ours, and, and, and it answers your question in a way. The, 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 I'm talk, I mean, there are two kinds of space program, as you mentioned. Either you use instruments to explore the universe or you use people, and they're quite different. And the United States has done very well with instruments and very badly with humans. We have wonderful space missions with instruments. I mean, this Cassini mission at Sat is exploring Saturn right now, and there's others exploring other parts of the solar system. And there are astronomical satellites, telescopes in orbit of various kinds. So there are wonderful missions exploring, all with instruments, not with people. That suits the United States, because we think in terms of decades, every mission is more or less planned and built within a 10, 10 or 20 years. And it produces then wonderful science and a lot of, 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 of great discoveries going on right now. So it's a huge success for the United States. On the other hand, the United States manned program is a dismal failure. We don't know what we're doing. We have no objectives. It's just a mess. If you go to Russia, it looks quite different. In, the Russians think in centuries, not in decades. So they regard manned program, the manned space program, as something that goes on for hundreds of years. And they just go ahead with it. And it's sort of, it's, it's, it's not really about science. It's much more about human destiny. Going into space is part of our destiny. It doesn't, happen, it doesn't have to happen in 10 years. 100 or 200 would be, off, would be fine. So the way they do their space missions is quite different from the way we do ours. It's much more ceremonial. I, I had the, the, the pleasure of, sort of being a spectator at, 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 at the launch where Charles Shimoni went up. Charles Shimoni was a paying guest who took a ride on the Soyuz launcher, went up to the space station and just as a tourist. And he was welcomed by the Russians because he pays cash. <laughs> and it was a very happy occasion. And the, the whole town comes out and the crew of the spacecraft parades through the town and then they stand at attention in the town square and report to the town authorities, we are ready to fly, and they get the blessing from the priest, uh, an Orthodox Russian priest. And it's done in that kind of spirit. There's no hurry. It doesn't have to be this year rather than next year. We're going to be just doing it and in the town, this is the town of Baikonur, which is actually in Kazakhstan, but it belongs to Russia. It's where the Russian space program began. And they have a museum there where their heroes are celebrated, going all the way back to Tsiolkovsky, who was sort of the pioneer of interplanetary flight, who he believed in manned space flight before anybody else. I mean, the Russians are rightly proud of him. And so their whole attitude is quite different. For them, the manned program makes a lot of sense because that's the ultimate destiny. We are going out there. We are going to spread all over the universe. And that's something important, but it's not going to happen for 100 years maybe or maybe longer. And uh, so it's our, grand our grandchildren who will inherit all this. And the Russians don't do well with instruments because they don't have enough cash and they are also uh, not, not in such a hurry about it anyway. It's, for them, it's not so important. So it's a good division of labor in a way. They have the manned program that works well. We have the unmanned program that works well. So we can collaborate quite nicely. Is there someone over here? I'm kind of running low on time here, but 
I'd like to hear you address a couple of the controversies related to specifically genetic engineering of organisms. The two main problems that seem to come up again and again in critiques of bioengineering are, first of all, that it tends to create economic disparities a lot more than it solves them. I, I can cite Golden Rice, for instance, which has really failed to deliver on most of its kind of public relations promises because it's mostly been an economic benefit to the agribusinesses that produces it rather than the farmers who are supposedly to benefit from it. And then the other controversy is that how do we keep bioengineered organisms from diminishing the genetic biodiversity that provides the source of this genetic material in the first place? How do we keep new strains of engineered plants, for instance, from displacing kind of the natural repository of genetic material that we have to work with? Yes, the answer is, of course, that both of those things are real problems, and they have to be fought one way or another. I mean, it's, it's, again, there is an analogy between biotech and computers. But Nor Norbert Wiener was the great enemy of computers in the early times. Norbert Wiener was a mathematician who uh, actually a brilliant man in, 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 in many areas. He considered computers were going to put humans out of business in some sense, that they would destroy employment for humans and therefore were evil. And, and uh, he fought very hard. Well, he wrote a book called The Human Use of Human Beings, which was excellent. I mean, he had all the right ideas. And everything he said, in a way, was true. Computers did destroy a lot of jobs. So in a way, they just sort of destroyed the working class as it had existed by removing the mechanical jobs. On the other hand, of course, the computers created tremendous numbers of jobs. And the question is, was it worth it? And that's a question of judgment. I think on the whole, most, most of us would say, yes, it was worth it. That the jobs that were created were mostly more interesting, mostly less degrading than the jobs that were destroyed. But you can have different opinions about that. But I think similar questions arise, of course, with biotech. That biotech is more efficient than natural agriculture. It will destroy farming jobs. But that's already happened. I mean, you know, nine-tenths of all the farming jobs are already gone. Just the improvement of farming methods, quite apart from biotech, already destroys jobs. Just me mechanization destroyed jobs. So the farms now are run with a handful of people, which in the old days took many more. So th there's always a trade-off. So I'm not saying those are not real problems, but I think in the case of the biotech companies, the golden rice, of course, has its virtues as well as its disadvantages. You can argue both ways. And uh, I think there's a good chance that in the end it does a lot more good than harm. But that's, uh, that remains to be seen. And certainly what is going to happen, if, if, I, if my uh, uh, notions are correct, that biotech is getting rapidly cheaper, that it will in fact be in the hands of the small farmers very, very, very soon. So the, 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 the small farmers can do their own biotech. They don't have to depend on Monsanto. Uh, so in the end, probably the f small farmers win. But that's not a foregone conclusion. So I think it's a good thing to keep the political battle alive. And it's a, essentially a political question how much power the small farmers have compared with the big companies. Okay. Go ahead. So when you were speaking about biotechnology, you made an analogy to computers, which you've reiterated. 
and you were talking about how much as uh, children today can have many electronic devices that we would not have imagined several decades ago, uh, children in the future may have biotechnology, things that they can fool around with. And I've seen what children can do to computers or even adults can do to computers, and it's not pretty. <laughs> so I'm wondering what you think about the ethical implications of unleashing children or even unexperienced adults on live organisms. Well, that, of course, is, again, a mixed blessing. I happen to, th I mean, in, 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 in the old-fashioned way, children were intimately involved with animals already. Any, any child that grows up on a farm is intimately involved with animals, and they may treat them well or they may treat them badly. So that's already happening, and uh, what we're doing now is only bringing that into the home. So your speeches, you were talking about um, how biology is going to be the future of science. What is your opinion on physical science, though, your field, and what is your opinion of modern theories like string theory? Yes, well, I wouldn't want to express opinions about string theory because I don't understand it. I, ne I never took the trouble to learn it. I mean, all that, all that you can say at the moment is it's going slowly and it's not having any particular effect on human affairs. So what physics is doing now, which is most important for human affairs, is making tools for other people to use. And so the most exciting part of physics from a human point of view, from a point of view of the general public, is producing tools for biologists and chemists and astronomers to use, which physicists, of course, can do very well. And so to, to my mind, that's the main excitement uh, uh, about physics. I mean, the low temperature physics, of course, has been making huge progress in the last 10 years. And it's on the small scale, not on a big scale. So it can go much faster. And the same is true of nanotechnology and various other things. So physics is certainly alive and well. Though only certain parts of it which have wandered off into the distance where people like me don't understand them anymore. And we'll do that. Let's go over here. We're just gonna, we're running out of time here, so let's go quick. My initial question was going to be about your opinion of uh, human exploration of space for colonization, but you answered that pretty well. So I'm just gonna ask, in the light of nanotechnology's ability and the Drexlerian sort of vision of being of explosive efficiency gains, um, combined with the past 60 years of technological development towards efficiency because of our decreasing ability to get high quality ores out of the ground. So the explosive efficiency plus like the wealth of new minerals we're finding on the bottom of the ocean floor. How do you see these trends intersecting in the next 20, 30 years? Thank you. Well, my predictions, of course, are no more reliable than anybody else's. But uh, I mean, what happened in, in the past, I can tell you about. I mean, the, the uh, biotechnology and nanotechnology started 50 years ago, sort of side by side. And there were, on the one hand, understanding living creatures. On the other hand, understanding tiny machines which could reproduce themselves, which was what the, the, sort of the Drexler view of nanotechnology. Now, it turned out that this wasn't an even contest at all. What actually happened was biotechnology raced ahead, nanotechnology stayed still for most of the 50 years. So nanotechnology turns out to be a useful branch of material science, but it hasn't had anything like the explosive effect that Drexler expected, whereas in the meantime, biotechnology has. So biotechnology is really where all the action is. So that's a, a question how that will continue. I mean, undoubtedly, nanotechnology will continue to make progress, 
that I somehow doubt that the self-reproducing machine is ever going to emerge because in a way it's sort of been already overtaken by biotech. If you want to build a self-reproducing machine today, all you have to do is to copy a bacterium and you more or less have it. So, it, so biotechnology has taken it over. So that, that's my view, but I, I could turn out, of course, the whole point about technology is it's unpredictable and the important things are the things you didn't expect. Okay, we're just going to do, I'm going to do one more because we're already like over time here. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I would like to know about your discovery of the equivalence of uh, Schwinger and Feynman's formulations of uh, quantum electrodynamics. So that's not a question I can really answer. I mean, I, I can just uh, uh, maybe make a, a couple of remarks. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that the time I grew up in physics was a very unusual time because all the big old famous people were revolutionaries. They all thought that they had to do something very brilliant to invent completely new ideas in order to make progress. Whereas the young people like me were conservatives, thinking that what we had in science was pretty good already. All we needed was to tidy up the details. And, and so that was an unusual time to come into the business, which was lucky for me, since I'm a sort of a tinkerer by nature. So the job of tidying up the details was something I could do. I didn't produce any new ideas, but I did do the tidying up job. And that's what happened. So it was just lucky. And the, the, the present time, I think, might be a little bit the same because, again, we have a situation where the older people are very often sort of reaching out to some big revolutionary ideas and not succeeding. Meanwhile, the young people are getting on with the job and, and actually making progress. That's good. Okay, we're going to have to cut because we're, we're way over. So, say thank you very much.